the truth as nothing else can. Why? For it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. We all know that not everyone's going to pick up a Bible and read it, right? People need to see the difference that the Bible and God's, what he's revealed to us, the difference that it makes in our lives. And so that's a be been a beautiful quote that we found many years ago. And uh, as we move forward today, we, we're all five of us are going to have a part to play. We're going to sing a song at the end. And we hope this, again, will be a blessing to you. Rebecca? So now that Daddy shared that quote, I want to just talk about the concept of putting Jerusalem first. In Mark 16, 15, we read, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every king creature. Jerusalem. Yeah, it was their home. It was the place they grew up. That's where they were raised. They lived all their life there. That's, that was like their home community. And so as we read these verses, um, I see that Jerusalem in like our day and age now, it would be like our families, the closest circle we have of influence around us, which is our families. Because if you say you throw a rock into a lake, the circles, they go out into broader circles. So if we start in Jerusalem and then our impact will go out to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to our communities, then to, it just gets broader until we are being a witness to the entire earth. We are to start by spreading the gospel in our, home, in our own homes, then to our neighbors, and then to our community, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. If Christianity is not transforming our own families and our own life, then we don't have anything to share with others. Sometimes, in our zeal to evangelize the world, we forget about the beautiful flock God has placed in our care. And that is not just the parents. Parents, to, yes, their most important job is to raise their children, but also for siblings and to be witnessing to their other siblings, to be friends with them and just the close-knitness that God had planned for the family. Sometimes I think we fail to realize that when we put Jerusalem first, we aren't isolating ourselves from the world around us. We are actually mobilizing the greatest evangelistic tool that we can attain. As the quote that Dad read earlier, it was, it's the greatest evidence of the power of Christianity. In Adventist home, it says, one well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Now, if you ask me, I think a sermon is a quite good evangelistic tool. I really think a thousand sermons is like huge, like that would have a ton of impact. But this is saying that our families can have more impact than a thousand sermons, or one godly family can have more impact than all the sermons that could ever be preached. And that to me sounds like an incredible, that doesn't sound like isolation to me, that sounds like mobilizing the greatest evangelistic tool there is to attain. So I'd like to say, where do we start? How do we raise mission-minded children? Well, it starts, it starts right at the beginning, even before you start having children. Um, it's getting your mindset and trying to figure out what principles do we want in our home. But then it goes a step further. It's dedicating your children to the Lord. And actually, when we're dedicating our children to the Lord, we're really dedicating not only them, but we're dedicating ourselves as parents to be raising up the children in the Lord. But another way that we are raising mission-minded children is in simple things. A lot of people put so much time and thought in choosing a name. <clears throat> but is your thoughts thinking about um, thoughts of choosing a name with purpose? 
to help establish that mission. Many people put a lot of time and effort into choosing names. And um, like for us, we did too. Um, the name like Nathan Daniel Hamilton. Nathan means a gift from the Lord. Daniel means God is my judge. And so we wanted him to know these things. And if you read through the Bible, so many Bible characters are specifically this, naming a mission for them or a statement for their life. You know, God is my judge or God is my, um, Jehovah is God or different things that, that different names mean. Well, um, there's other things you can do. I, I chose to put my children's name to song. So I, so that um, when Nathan, like for example, I'll use his song. When he was just little, <clears throat> we would sing several times a day. Nathan Daniel Hamilton, that's my name. Nathan Daniel Hamilton, that's my name. Nathan means a gift from the Lord. Daniel means God is my judge. I will serve God every day, and he will show me how to live. Nathan Daniel Hamilton, that's my name. Yeah. And we would sing that together every morning, every night, throughout the day, just be singing it. And he would learn his name. And at family worship time, we'd go around and, and um, sing each other's name songs, you know. And uh, like Rebecca, her name, I didn't like the, the meaning of the name so much, but I liked the character of the person in the Bible, Rebecca. So her song was more the character Rebecca Raylene, she's my little girl, helpful and kind. All of the time she goes above and beyond in all that she does. She's a ray of sunshine, a ray of sunshine for Jesus. And we could sing those songs, but it's got purpose written into it. Um, I'll let you guys ask Andrew what his is and, and the other ones. Um, but um, I, other people, they put um, by life verses, you know, um, th they would sing all the time. Now, lots of you guys do that, sing memory verse songs like, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Well, in our, in our worships, we are instilling those principles of mission in the children. Um, another key point that... Um, let me just get the slide moving. There we go. There we go. Um, oh, you are to disciple your children. How many of you have noticed the root word of discipline? What is the root word of discipline? It's the same word as disciple. So whenever you're working with your children, keep in mind that no matter how I respond to this situation, am I discipling my children? Um, with my discipline. And it will help us to remember the goal. It's not just to get good behavior out of the kids, you know, but to, to try to, the ways that we go about it, are you helping them to grow closer to the Lord? Another point is to be safe for your children. Be safe for them to come to you with their faults, with their failures, and their plans for the future. Talk together about it. And, um, and just be a safe place so that there's open and trust and transparency in your relationship and, in, and working together. Also, a lot of times they're like, um, if your, your home is founded on God's principles, um, and most of the time instilling the principles of being mission-minded family, it's unremarkable. It just becomes an ordinary way of life. But that is what is most striking to the world around you. Without you even knowing it, without you even realizing it, 
Those principles are being played out just as your regular day of life, but the other people stop and take notice because it is different. Um, invite your children to join in with you um, regarding your working for the Lord. Invite them to be part of it. Um, just a quick example, my dad, <clears throat> he was a, a teacher, um, and he was called into the ministry. And so he sat down with his children, and he said, guys, I've been asked to go into the ministry. I love what I'm doing. I'm a teacher. You guys, this is how it's going to impact your life. Um, and I don't want to go into the ministry alone because I don't believe it's a one thing. Uh, I'm happy to stay where we are, um, but I don't want to go into the ministry unless everybody wants to go into it. So you stop, you pray about it, you think about it, and if you think it's going to be too hard or too difficult, then I'll stay a principal. But you guys choose and, and pray about it, which way God's leading. But if we go into the ministry, we're going to do it as a family. And we all went and we prayed. And I know for me it was very empowering because I was praying and I felt the God, call of God in my heart, yes, to go into ministry. Um, and we took a family vote and it was unanimous. But, um, but from then on, you know, whenever things happened, he's like, you're in it with me. But yes, some of you guys won't be ministerial families, but find ways to call them and to invite them to be part of doing service together, um, to have them feel like they're, they're as much part of the team as, as uh, the parents are. Okay, raising your children to be missionaries or disciples of the Lord is going to be countercultural, and there'll be a lot of peer pressure. So talk with your children, and um, because they're gonna be the most sensitive to it, and equip your children to stand and not compromise. Okay, and the last point around this part is, um, remember even if you dis uh, disciple your children for the Lord, it's the Lord working on the child's heart that brings about salvation. Um, the, their salvation is their decision. Um, and, but it's a miracle from the Lord every time a child hears the word of God for themselves and responds and responds to it so watch and pray for your children that they will hear god's voice for themselves and that they will respond and keep praying for them because you can lead them to the lord but it's their decision to go forward all right some practical things that you can do to help your children become mission-minded is go visiting Visit your neighbors, visit your church members, visit shut-ins. Once the, you're, you're teaching them from very early on to visit people and to start caring about people. And what does caring about people mean? It, it doesn't necessarily come naturally. You need to practice. And practice in your homes things like um, learning to eat healthy. Cook healthy, let them learn to cook, and then um, invite them, um, like, um, to help with the diabetes undone and which meal are you going to cook for diabetes undone and get them involved with cooking the meal it's amazing uh, at the diabetes undone we had you know we mentioned that Rebecca and I think she was 13 at the time had cooked one of the meals and the people were like really she knows how to cook healthy you know, and it's like, yeah, she does, you know, and, but it was, it was fun, it, because they can start saying, oh, I know how to have healthier life, and I can teach other people. Um, also, teach how to do natural remedies, practice it in your home, practice it on each other, and then let them watch you as you're doing it to others, and they will start doing that. Right here, the conference office owns all the materials to do a child health expo. Take them, take them to your churches and use these materials and do a health expo for your community and get the kids involved doing the health expo. Um, 
And then invite people, especially if you want the mission minded, invite people that are new to the area, people who are of um, different backgrounds, different countries, whether they're refugees, other languages, and um, invite them into your home. Other things you can do is read mission stories. Every Friday night, we read mission stories together. Choose, um, pray for other people together and choose a, a country or a people group and pray for them and study about those people groups. And then you can go to My Language, My Life. It's, a, it's um, on the internet and you can print out cards. In My Language, My Life, one of my friends, Scott Griswold, helped to de um, develop this. And it's basically um, just a business card and you give it to anybody who has like a different language. And th this website has all kinds of Christian materials, all different things, and it's in about 100 different languages. And all they have to do is go click on it. You may not, I like a Korean person. I've talked to them, we say hi, and to, can barely get past that. But it's like, oh, here, this is good for you. You can go listen to it. And they've taken those cards, gone home, and they can listen to anything in their own language. Okay, so it's time for me to wrap this up. But, um, yeah, and I forgot to show these things. And ch challenge your children. Find ways to reach out and find projects they can. This one's helping Pugwash save their horse program. And um, get them involved with ministering for others. Claim your neighborhood. Claim your schools um, for the Lord. And pray for them. Pray together. And... Um, just teaching your children how to have conversations and turn it toward the Lord. So those are all ways to help develop the children to have a mission-mindedness. Amen. Just one little thing I'd like to share to kind of take a step back, maybe to yesterday. The things that we're sharing today assume that you know we're going to be talking a lot about doing today in a sense this is all based on the premise that we're being with jesus okay i like to boil christianity down to prayer bible study and service so we're going to talk about service today um i'll just show you a couple of things like having family worship is so 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 important with kids and what was really really helpful for us is um we purchased these probably 10 years ago now, but there's something called the International Children's Bible. This is not a comic strip type of Bible. I don't like those. This is a excellent translation, but when they were, after they were translating it, they simplified the English down so that a student in grade three or four or five could easily understand it. So our children started reading this when they were six, seven, eight years old and reading the stories and having family worship. Mom and dad would have their new King James. The kids would have the International Children's Bible. And, uh, you know, now they've grown from that. Now they're new, using the New King James Version. But, but they fell in love with the scriptures from this. Okay, I want to share that. It's a beautiful Bible. It's a beautiful translation. More than once, and actually many times, I'd check the Adventist Bible commentary when we were stuck on a difficult passage, and then I'd have one of the kids read this verse, and it was bang on. It was amazing to me. Oh, what a beautiful job they did with this translation. But anyways... And then because when kids are young, their attention span is only so long, right? So the white estate very faithfully simplified, or not simplified, shortened the Conflict of the Ages series. And this series is uh, an adaptation in today's English language. And it took 3,500 pages of the Conflict series and squeezed it down into these five little books, their paperback. And that's what we, for the last two years in our home, we've studied the Bible from Daniel, now we're into, Re or sorry, Genesis, now we're into Revelation, going through this series, okay? Nathan and Rebecca and sometimes Andrew read the full editions, okay? But to make a half an hour of family worship in the morning exciting and not too long, we use these simplified versions to start. So I simply want to say all this doing things that we're going to be sharing, it's all got to be based on having a relationship with Jesus. It starts with prayer, Bible study, and then finally to service. Make sense? And I know some people prefer the old King James Version. Praise the Lord. If your children can understand that at a young age, praise God. 
So here we are in the Oak Park Church. A couple of years ago, we got the kids involved and all the, actually I see uh, Melissa there. We're packing shoe boxes um, for that program that they were doing, doing the shoe box and sending them around the world to the young people. Uh, Ministry of Healing says the world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, both physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. So God wants to do a great work in our day, amen? Through our families, through our churches. And it's all by the grace of God. Christ's method alone will give true success. You all know this beautiful quote, right? In, receiving the pe- in reaching the people. How did Jesus do it? The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. You know, why did you come to camp meeting? Did you just come to be blessed or did you come to be a blessing? Last night I left one of the buildings and I walked that way a few hundred feet and someone came up to me and they were sharing some of the struggles that they were having. After that was over, after a half an hour or so, I went this direction, back to the cabin, I, somebody else came up to me. And I was there for a half an hour. People have struggles. They're hurting. Take time to mingle with people. Show, you, show your sympathy. Minister their needs. Win their confidence. And then bid them to follow Jesus. There is a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less, I like to read these every now and then. It's kind of a paradigm shift for me. Gets me headed to true north again. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time was spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, and the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, and the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion and the power of prayer and the power of the love of God, this work will not and cannot be without fruit. I just, that's my true north, if you will, recalibrating what God wants us to be doing in life. I love it. We've tried to teach our children from a very young age to enjoy working and doing productive things. And uh, just going to flip through a few pictures here. We had a family that was, you know, they were struggling a little bit, and they needed some firewood. One Sunday in Oak Park, uh, some of the Oak Park church members came out, and I took the boys over to Oak Park, and Harold Newell had some firewood that was stacked up on one of his pieces of property, and I think we started at 9 or 10 in the morning, and we finished at 9 o'clock at night. We filled an entire dump truck with four cords of of wood all chunked up into short pieces and then the next day Harold had delivered it to the, uh, to the family. The kids loved it. There's Andrew in the back of the dump truck. He stacked that entire load by himself. It was like eight or ten hours work. It was a lot of fun. Working together. Get your children active in outreach programs with your community. Years ago when we were back here in the Pugwash district, there was a Bethlehem Live program going on in Pugwash and the kids were little and they loved animals and uh, the people in the community could walk through and see what Bethlehem might have been like back in the olden days when Jesus was born. We tried to encourage the kids to help us with uh, distributing literature. Here's a, a book written by Mark Finley, Hope in Troubled Times. You know, there's a dear couple in Digby. They handed out a thousand of these books. A thousand. Pretty much every home in Digby received one if they were interested. And this was during covid Instead of being bunkered down in our home with our masks on and all worried about everything, they had their masks out and they were sharing. A week later, a pastor, could we get some more books? We just handed out another two, four hundred. Called the ABC in Oshawa. They were out of books, so I called out to Alberta. They had some. Ship them here, please. And over about a month, six weeks span of time, pretty much every, every home in Digby was received a book. There's the shoebox program at the end of the day after the kids stack them all. Here we did a, uh, you know, we kind of like to have a, an improved substitute for Halloween and things like that. So we did a Reformation celebration at the Digby Church. There's Dan Kelly up front and 
uh, Tewe and the kids, and I'm standing there as Martin Luther. And uh, we just acted out the whole a part of, the, uh, of Martin Luther's great speech and so on. Look for ways to serve your community. With kids, you know, it, it's, that enjoy working, it's so easy to make friends with the community because they, you know, people are getting older, right? And they need some help. And hey, do you think our, your kids could help out cutting our lawn and different things? Here's our, um, the gentleman up the street I mentioned, I think it was yesterday, that uh, owns the uh, two or 3,000 tr fruit trees. And some of his workers are getting older and the kids have been helping him out with pruning every spring and picking all his fruit in the, in the fall. And even Andrew's been involved just lately, going up and doing different jobs for him. And as he gets a little older, he'll be able to run the pneumatic pruners as well. So there's all kinds of things. You know, we come, become good friends with our neighbors and the people that they work for. Invite others to join you for family worship or other activities. We enjoy singing on Friday evening to bring in the Sabbath. And uh, it's interesting, one of our neighbors heard us one time. Is, could, we, could I come over and join you sometime? And here we have a lady across the street who came over and joined us several times now to uh, enjoy singing with us on Friday evening. Here's some church members visiting at our place. Hmm? Yeah, Andrew's turn. Okay, Andrew. Your turn, honey. All right, so I'm going to be talking about being a missionary and the steps that have helped me um, to be a better missionary where I've been. So um, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you think when you read our title, Family a Missionary Center? Well, what I th immediately think I think of is something like the sun. The, um, the gases are constantly fueling each other up and um, in the core and then the heat and electrons on the surface shooting out as solar flares in the direction as rays of light in the dark universe. So if this is what um, a missionary center is, um, then this is what our home should be like. Um, So I'd like to ask, this is something I've been asking myself, and it's something that I'd like to ask us all here. How can we be missionary-minded people? How can we be a missionary-minded young person? Um, so when I was preparing my sermon, I was trying to... Uh, um, wrestling through this topic of trying to be a missionary and I asked my mom and she gave me these five steps and some of you know that she's been a, a missionary in uh, Cambodia, Thailand, the Marshall Islands and Dominican Republic but um, and none of, some of you also might know that that's what like, I'd like to be when I grow up uh, an overseas missionary um, so she gave me these five steps it's, you need to uh, have a relationship with Jesus or you don't have anything to give. Um, you need to care about others. We need to pray for God to open opportunities to witness. Um, we need to look for opportunities to help others. And we need to equip ourselves um, to meet those needs of those who we want to help. So, um, just a story. I was just working for one of our neighbors, as Dad mentioned, we do a lot. <laughs> um, and I was just um, doing some job for her, and she uh, said, man, you do really good work. And I had answered, oh, thank you very much. And um, she said, um, but then later I was just, you know, wondering, 
And I'm like, I should say something about God and how I love Jesus and how she's been, he's been helping me. So um, at the end of the day, well, I was praying most of the time through. <laughs> at the end of the day, God gave me an opportunity. To, and she had said again, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate your work. Um, so I, had rep I replied, thank you. Uh, by God's grace, I do my work to the best of my abilities. And I, I don't know what happened next, but it just seemed like she had been touched. And I'm, I'm so thankful that God is able to work through us, give us a second opportunities. Um, another uh, quick story is um, we were... Uh, I was, um, one of our neighbors is giving me um, bagpipe lessons. So I go over there and after that we play games and um, we talk and it's been amazing. We've been able to talk about uh, spiritual matters and all sorts of stuff. And we've, we've been really friends. Um, this has been happening for about two years. And we've just been able to, uh, he keeps saying I've been a blessing to him. The truth is, though, he's been a really serious blessing to me. Um, he's probably one of the best friends I have in our neighborhood. And God's just been able to use me, and we are so thankful for having the most wonderful neighbors. Um, and I'd like to say, say somebody needs pruning done. Ask somebody how to learn it so that we can fill that need and we can have fun learning that. And working for Jesus is such a wonderful thing. We are blessed with the opportunity to be able to work for Jesus and do what God could have chosen for the angels, but he chose us. And we need to be a blessing. And he has given us such a blessing to uh, be able to tell um, people about Jesus and the wonderful hope for the future. Another story is about um, we were in as some of you go, no, we uh, deliver eggs to most all of our neighbors and we've had a business from that, from our old house we've, and now in our new house that's just been one of our um, businesses and um, so I went to our one neighbor, and um, she had said, man, I, I love to come out on my porch and hear you sing in your garden. And I'm like, it's, and she's like, that's so beautiful. And I'm like, man, I hope she didn't see us arguing or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just amazing, the little things that has touched our neighbors and how we can be a blessing to our neighbors and to just all just the wonderful opportunities God's given us to be working for him and that he has given us the job of being his ambassadors on this earth for Jesus and I'm so thankful for that. I want to just share, share something real briefly. A few years ago, David Streifling and I led out with a building project down in Truro. You'll see it right across from the Walmart building. And um, David was able to arrange to have Maranatha come for about six weeks and do a huge amount of work for us. It really pushed us forward. But whenever there's something like that going on, like that was a big project, right? Get your kids involved. They love doing things. We, I, sorry, we didn't get the photos, but... Uh, Kids were up helping putting on shingles. They built the uh, shed in the backyard, a good portion of it. They really got involved, and it was a lot of fun for them. And, you know, there's not that many Maranatha projects that go on, right? So it's like, wow, this is in our own backyard. Let's get them involved. So whenever there's something happening, just take advantage of the opportunity. Kids love to enjoy, learn new projects. And thanks to David, they did, were able to learn some new skills in the whole process. You know, as, uh, as they were talking, it reminded me of a, some friends of mine that we, I met in the last year. And, you know, 
he was telling me about his youngest, uh, the, the man, the pastor, was telling me about his youngest son, and, and he told me how his youngest son, right from an early age, began to, you know, you know, the money he got, he's like, well, what do I do with this, Dad? And, and he's like, well, that's up to you, son. And he's like, well, Dad, I, I, I want to use it as a mission, ministry. And, um, and, so, and so he's like, okay, what are you going to do? And he's like, I know what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to buy good, wholesome Silver Hills bread, and I'm going to take it and give a loaf to all of our neighbors, and I'm going to talk to them. And so the whole family went down the, you know, from neighbor to neighbor, giving them bread with, with, with the one. Like, so when I, I mean, I know when I heard that story, I was thinking, this young boy is giving all the money that he makes in his, you know, at eight or ten years old, to the Lord in his service. And I was thinking, and it was, it was humbling to me to think, you know, that is, that's, that's sacrifice, giving everything that you have for the Lord. And um, even at an early age like that, and to me that was inspiring to see. And, and, but the, the principle that also it, it taught me in hearing this story is that they didn't just have him go along to the neighbors and do his little ministry. They did it as a family. And the family said now they were good friends with so many neighbors they didn't even know they had. And, and um, <laughs> the little boy is always buying more bread. So that it's, a, it's a bit of an, uh, a, a nonstop ministry. And so just, just little things like that, that ministry as a family is God's design, as we've been, as we've been seeing talking about, but um, it's, it's God's design that we do it together, because that's why he put us with all of, you know, our different talents and weaknesses together so that his name can be glorified, and there's no time better than the young years to do ministry, and um, as I think about this, it reminds me of, of, of how um, young people, young, young people often think that their real big part of life comes once they get married. You know, once they get married, then they're going to really, or once they leave home or whatever, then they're going to really be ministry, missionaries or whatever. But this is actually not the case. God has put us in our families as missionaries, and that is our place to be missionaries, for the most part, until he gives us, you know, until he gives us, you know, either moving us away to do ministry or to our next families. And life in this world, it's about love. Jesus' Jesus's life is about loving us. And so our life should be about loving him in return, even when we're small, and loving him as a family. Um, I want to... Uh, declaration of dependence. Well, the declaration of independence is, is when the... Uh, before the United States was even... The United States... The colonies decided that they were going. To, they decided that they wanted to be free from English rule, and so they declared that they were independent of the English rule. And you know, and that, that led on to the, the war that happened, and eventually splitting off from the from England um, and becoming their own country. But I want to read to you from a book called. Our Ebenezer, this has been a huge blessing to me and my family reading this. Reading this book is just, it's by the Dysinger family. They're um, farmers down in uh, Tennessee, Adventist people, amazing people who love the Lord with all their hearts. And reading this book was really humbling for me, to be honest, because I saw what true faith looks like, true trust what true following God looks like in our lives. And it was, it was unbelievable to me how far they followed God even when it did not seem like it was making sense. And yet they clung on to that and, and, that, and that was just amazing. And so um, periodically through the book, it uh, has different, different uh, parts and one of it is called the Declaration of Dependence. And this is, a, this is something that they were sharing that they'd learned and it says, we are taught from an early age that the goal of manhood um, is to become independent. A boy moves from one end of the spectrum, total dependence at birth, to the other end, being on my own and a at age 18 or 21. This independence is encouraged, admired, and celebrated by our culture. 
There is an independence from the world systems that is admirable, like energy and uh, food independence. Um, but I question, and this is them saying, but I question society's whole emphasis on independence. Is it biblical? Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing, John 5.30. He also says to his disciples, without me ye can do nothing. The problem with the Laodicean church is that they have need of nothing. Um, they think that they are independent, but God tells them that they are actually in a wretched condition and need to feel their total dependence. I would like to propose a paradigm shift, they said, from celebrating our independence. From my personal experience and study, I suggest that the spectrum should go from total dependence on earthly parents to total dependence on God. Why else would Jesus encourage the rich young ruler to sell all that he had? Why else would he commend the widow for giving her last two mites? He wants us to feel keenly our dependence on him. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10. Now that is something to celebrate. Um, when I read this, it was like, wow. This was a new thought. It's, it's, it's about being dependent on God always and, and teaching that in our families from an early age. And that is just, just so beautiful. Um, but the one other thing I want to talk about is every single individual is called to be a missionary. Being a missionary family is made up of individuals. And being a missionary... Um, Actually, let me. Tr uh, true education is missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men, and to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. Growing up, living through life, all the way to the end of our lives is education. Um, education is a work of a lifetime, and true education is missionary training. God has called each person in this room to be a missionary. And that, what does that mean? Does that mean? Does that mean that we work all week away from our families, away from our Jerusalem, the first missionary field? Does that mean we're out there kind of doing mission work, but kind of not? God has placed us in, each one of us, in places that we can be full-time missionaries for Him as we're full-time working, as we have to do in this world. But um, just the point is that as families, each family has a bunch of full-time missionaries that can band together for his work. And, th and this is a, a beautiful blessing. And um, there's obviously we have to work and, and do these things to raise our families, to, to support our families or whatever. But God has called us that in this we are missionary, not just on the weekends. And, and, uh, and so if we can keep this idea of being a living missionary, a full-time missionary for the Lord, this will transform our families, I believe. So, yeah, these, these are a couple of the things that have jumped out to me. But this, this whole idea of being of declaration of dependence, we must be dependent on God, and He's the one who can, can make us anything. As we're wrapping up this series from the week, um, we just want to reunify that the fact, the purpose for family existence, the reason God placed us on this earth as families and as individuals is to spread the gospel to the world and to show and live love to our communities and to our families and to everyone. The purpose of discipleship is so our family can come to the place that we are ready to go and impact the world for Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of everything. Sometimes I feel like we can get, we get so caught up with the fact, well, we need a, we, our families want to go to heaven. We need to get ready to go to heaven. But we sometimes forget that we, are, we need to get ourselves ready for heaven. Yes, we need to fall in love with Jesus, but then that's not just getting ourselves ready. We need to be able to go and get our, our neighbors, our community, 
and all those out there in darkness to come with us. Because unless we share it with others, then it's not, we're not on fire for the Lord. We haven't completely surrendered to Jesus. That's the whole point of our existence here on earth, is that we, we might be thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a missionary. I'm not, you know, a literature evangelist. I just want to go to heaven. But the responsibility rests equally on all of us. Um, Ministry of Healing, page 148, says, To everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Individually, we are to stand in our lot and place saying, Here am I, send me. Upon the minister of the word, the missionary nurse, the Christian physician, or the individual Christian, whether he be merchant or farmer, professional man or mechanic, the responsibility rests upon all. It is the work to reveal to men the gospel of their salvation. Every enterprise in which we engage should be a means to this end. This quote here may not have your exact profession in it, but in the list, I think what the, um, Mrs. White is trying to convey here is that no matter what we're doing, we are responsible through our every action to be conveying to men the gospel of their salvation. This is the very reason for our existence on earth. I know there's been many times when I've had the opportunity I could say something or tell somebody somebody, but I haven't. And I will always feel bad for that. But if we're praying every day to make us willing to, when God impresses us on our hearts to do something, that we follow through and we do do it. We are called to do more than just simply be prepared for the life, for heaven. The gospel needs soldiers like you and like us in this Christian battle who are passionate about the gospel and who are passionate about spreading and sharing God's love with those around us. Um, actually, this came, we got this quote from the, this success equation, they call it, from the Nevelets. It was really... It was really neat for me. Commitment plus faithfulness equals greatness. We need to be committed to the cause that we are involved in, and that is raising our families to be a blessing to the world, to share Jesus' love to others. If we are committed to the gospel, then we need to be, and to raising our families with Christ at the center, We need to be faithful to that commitment. And then after that, it will equal greatness. Not greatness is in the individual, but the result will be doing great things for the Lord. That is our ultimate goal, amen? It's to share Jesus to this dying world. As we close, we'd like to sing a song that's entitled, Home in the Home in Jesus' Hands.
walk and stay. The darkness turns to day. When Christ is the light of the family, that home is the light in the land. A beacon so bright it shines through the night. That's proof that a family can stand when their home is in as we pray. Father God, we, including the Hamilton family, are sinful human beings. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the privilege of meeting you and getting to know you before I started a family so that from the very beginning you could be the center of our home. I pray, dear God, for the same for every family in the Maritimes and around the world, that people can have the joy of having Jesus center of their lives. Bless each family here. Lord, we all have different struggles. We've made a, our share of blunders, but thank you that you're working with each of us. And day by day, week by week, year by year, we can become a little more like Jesus and bring our lives into harmony with you. Bless us all, Lord. Bless. Thank you for the beautiful church families that we've had the privilege of working with, for the blessing that they've been to us, to our children. And I pray that everyone else here will en enjoy that same experience. Thank you for giving us your word. that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We are not orphans in this world. We have a heavenly Father who loves us and has a plan for our future. Lord, may each one of us dig into your word and ask every day, Lord, what is it you would have me to do with my time today? Bless us all, and we thank you for the privilege of being here at camp meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. And amen. Bless you, everyone.
The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But before we begin, let's pray. Gracious Father, you are the great physician. Lord, you're so good to us. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit will work through all of us, Lord, so that we can be the people that you desire for us to be. Set us free, Lord, from everything that has us bound in chains, Lord. We want to thank you. We want to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Alleluia. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. Tara, you go for it. Good afternoon. Have you been blessed so far? It's such a blessing to have so many wonderful people um, that have wonderful experiences with the Lord and share how share with us so that we can, you know, start practicing taking ideas from each other and growing together as a family. And that's what this camp meeting is all about: growing God's family. So today, as you see, we are going to be talking about freedom from fear. I'm going to ask a very obvious question. How many of you have been fearful? Ever in your lives. <laughs> Everyone has been fearful. And fear is not a very happy feeling. Sometimes it's been because the Lord has given us you know, emergency fear, which is a good thing, because sometimes we do have to run from a, a dog that is coming to bite us in the neck. So we have that adrenaline rush, and that is perfect for that need at the time. But the kind of fear that the Bible talks about that is not so good is extremely detrimental. It's detrimental to us in all kinds of ways. So we're going to just look for a moment at what the word fear really means. We're going to define it, just regular def definition. Fear is a human emotion that is triggered by a perceived threat, a basic survival mechanism that signals our bodies to respond to danger with a fight or flight response. As such, it is an essential part of keeping us safe. So just like I said, the Lord has put it within us, too, to be fearful just enough for us to get out of danger. Isn't that a blessing? So when we have to do something extremely emergency, we can perform it by the grace of God. And I know some of us have been in those situations, either a child um, or, uh, you know, some, I've heard of, there was one experience I heard about where, um, there was a little girl in the restaurant and with her parents and she started to choke and the parents didn't know what to do. And there just happened to be a lady in, right in the next table that was a nurse and she performed CPR on her quick. So everything was just boom, 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 performed it. She was able to save her life. And so th these are beautiful things, but that's what it's for. That's what it's specifically for. <clears throat> Let's turn to, well, before we do that, let's, let's uh, look at something here. Um, however, when people live in constant fear, whether from physical dangers in their environment or threats they perceive, they can experience negative impacts in all the areas of their lives. 
and even become incapacitated, crippled by fear. So how did fear become so prominent in our world today? Where did it all start? Let's turn to Genesis 2, 25, and then we're going to go to chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Genesis 2, 25, and then to Genesis 3, 8, and 9. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, speaking of Adam and Eve, and were not ashamed. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And what are those three words? I was afraid. The first time the Bible records fear. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So who did Adam hide himself from? Can you believe that? Can you believe hiding yourself away from the one who created you and made you and who loves you and who seeks to bless you? Hiding from the one who created you. Fear always drives us away from God. It does. The origin of fear is sin. The first sin came from disobedience to God's command. Therefore, when we decide to do things our way, we show a lack of trust in the one who knows best and who desires the best for us. And that's a sad state. Let's look at the dangers, the dangerous effects of fear on our health. Once we sense a potential danger, our body releases these hormones that impact our physical health, our memory, our brain processing, as well as our mental health. So look at at physical health. Look at what it does. Fear weakens our immune system, and it can cause cardiovascular damage, gastrointestinal problems, which I've experienced before when I'm fearful. The first thing that happens to me is right in here in in the core of my stomach. It just twists and turns. Mm -hmm. It just automatically It also causes ulcers. Have you heard of people having ulcers? Mm Mm-hmm. And irritable bowel syndrome and a decreased fertility. Women trying to have babies for years and years and years and they just can't because they're crippled by fear. Can you imagine that? It can lead to accelerated aging, more wrinkles. I don't know how excited we are about that. And even premature death. What about our memory? Fear can impair formation of long-term memories. We can start forgetting those wonderful memories we've had when we were younger because of fear. It can cripple us that way and cause damage to certain parts of our brain. This can make it even more difficult to regulate fear and can leave a person anxious most of the time. Have you ever met somebody with high anxiety and they just cannot find peace whatsoever? Their, Their memory and their physical being is being impacted in a very horrible way. And they need to be released. To someone in chronic fear, the world looks very scary and their memories confirm the fear. What about brain processing and reactivity? Fear can, co- can interrupt processes in our brain that allow us to regulate our emotions and read nonverbal cues and other important information presented to us. So sometimes we could be so fearful for those students who are in school and they're so fearful, fearful, fearful about the exam and they go into the exam room and totally forget every single thing they studied. (sighs) This impacts our thinking and decision making in negative ways, leaving us susceptible to intense emotions and impulsive reactions. All of these effects can leave us unable to act appropriately. And what about our mental health? How many of you know people that are on drugs for mental health, for depression? It's, it's really fear-based. Fearful about this, fearful about that, and it's completely shutting down our capacity and our mental health to even to deal with day-to-day things. Brothers and sisters, are you fearful? Are you fearful today? 
I'm going to read a very heavy verse, Revelation 21, verse 8. And I'm not, I'm not reading it to discourage you, but I want you to see that fear can keep us from eternal life. Let me show you why. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Why is fearful in there? Why is fear part of all those evil things? Can anyone tell me? Why do you think fear is in there? Sorry? Okay, yes. It's the opposite of faith. And we know that those who make it to the, the end times will have the faith of Jesus, it says, right? So fearful, if you're fearful, we have to really, really think where we're, our hearts are at and where our gods are. Because sometimes we can make our fears our God. Idolatry is definitely not in God's plan. I read a commentary that puts it like this. But the fearful, because the, I don't know who the commentary is from. I think it may be Matthew Henry commentary. But it says, but the fearful, such who are a cowardly spirit and are not valiant for the truth, but who, through the fear of men, either make no profession of Christ and his gospel, or having made it, they drop it, lest they should be, be exposed to tribulation and persecution. These are they that are afraid of the beast and live in servile bondage to him. Have mercy. Romans 6, verse 16. Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And then I read this quote here in, from the great controversy. Satan works through fear. That is his major way of getting us to fall, even the very elect. It says this, God never forces the will or conscience, but Satan's constant resort. This is the only way he knows how to, I mean, he, sometimes you should say, can't you get a little more creative? <laughs> but he uses the same tactics all the time. To gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defense of the law of God. I think we saw that a little bit these past two years. What do you think? Yeah, I think we saw that. But there's good news. Now you can start to smile. <laughs> Jesus went to the cross to set us free. Amen. I only got one amen. amen. <laughs> Jesus went to the cross to set us free. Listen to this quote. Speaking of the disciples in the storm on the sea, Absorbed in their efforts to save themselves, they had forgotten that Jesus was on board. Now, seeing only death before them, they remembered at whose command they had set out to, the cro to cross the sea. In Jesus was their only hope. Master, master! But their voices were drowned by the roaring of the tempest, and there was no reply. Why do you think Jesus didn't reply yet? Why do you think he waited a little bit? Do you think he actually just didn't hear them? <laughs> Let's read on. <clears throat> Doubt and fear. What is that word? Doubt. Doubt and fear. They go hand in hand. Assailed them. Was he who had conquered disease and demons and even death powerless to help his disciples now? Was he unmindful of their distress? This is my favorite part. He lifted his hands and said to the angry sea, Peace, 
be still. <sighs> wow, that's all I got was a little amen. <laughs> what did he say? Peace, be still. He's asking us today to put our complete trust in him. Just throw yourself at his feet and believe his words, peace, be still. Are you afraid of dying? Because Jesus says, peace, be still. Are you afraid of losing a loved one? Jesus says, peace, be still. Are you afraid of failure? Jesus says, peace, be still, my brother. Are you afraid of the future, the end times? Jesus says, peace, be still. Are you afraid of getting a disease? <clears throat> Are you afraid of getting a disease? Jesus says, Peace, be still. Are you afraid of being robbed at night, being broken into? Because I know people that are. Jesus says, peace, be still. Are you afraid of poverty, losing your job? Jesus says, peace, be still. Are you afraid of man and what they can do to you, do around, behind your back, do when you're not looking? Are you afraid of authorities? Are you afraid of the government? Are you afraid of your own husband or wife? Are you afraid? Jesus says, peace be still. Are you afraid of the devil and his plans? He's pretty mean. Peace be still. Jesus can deliver us from all of our fears because he, he told us to cast all of our fears on him. I heard a story that I just have to read to you. Um, her name is Rose Polly. That really touched my heart. And I thought that it would be nice to read it in her own words. So bear with me. It was around the noon hour, and I had just come home from dropping off lunch to my three young sons. Up the street was a car, and a man was getting out of it. His head was dark. When he got out, about two feet from me, I recognized him as someone I knew. He had come to our house a year earlier when he had been going door to door to do cabinet work. I dropped all those defenses, all those warnings, and I said, come on in. I led him around the front of the house. When we came through the front door, and at that moment, he came up behind me, grabbed me from behind, held a knife to my neck, and he said these words, Rose, don't struggle, don't scream, don't resist. Just walk upstairs. I started to pray to myself, most holy God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you bind the power of Satan in this man and that you fill him with the spirit of God. I ask that you send your holy angels to surround me and keep me safe. Lord, I ask that you let this man know that you love him and that you don't want him to destroy his life by doing this. I turned and looked right at him and said, God loves you and he doesn't want you to destroy your life. He stopped. He didn't move. And what seemed like an eternity, we just stood there. And then he hung his head and he sighed. I ducked past him and headed for my front door. He tried to grab me to keep me in my house. However, the next thing I knew, I was on my front porch. I don't remember how I got there, but I then went and I just sat down on the street curb. I was in shock. I was certainly not thinking totally clearly, and no kidding, but he came and sat down beside me. I looked over at him and said, I've got to pray for you, but I don't even remember what your name is. What is your name? And he said, my name is Matt. I just started praying on the curb, and I still remember the words I said 16 years ago. Most holy God, thank you so much for saving my life. Thank you for being my knight in shining armor. Thank you for being the God that I can trust. And then I started praying for the man. When I finished praying for him, I looked over at him, 
and he was crying. And he said his, and he had his hands in his face, and he was just saying, oh, I can't believe what I've almost done. I can't believe what I've almost done. He looked up at me and said, I need a savior. I looked right at him and said, your savior is Jesus Christ. You can find him in the Bible. I remember thinking, I don't feel a lot of fear right now. I don't feel a lot of fear. But is that because I know that now, this is later on, he's locked up in a detention center and he can't come out and get me? When I heard he left, I started feeling fear coming in. It started strangling me. It started feeling like it was just grabbing hold and crushing me. I remembered a story in scripture about Hezekiah when he had a threatening letter from a general of the army that came and said, I'm going to do you in. Hezekiah took that letter into the very temple of God and he spread it out before the Lord. He spread it out. He is fear and all that he needed to tell the Lord in that letter. God then gave him strength and words that took his fear away. It's like the Lord just said, where's your sword, Rose? I remembered Ephesians 6 that talks about the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit being the word of God. And it was in that night, in the darkness of my room, that I started speaking into the air scripture that I had learned as a child. Psalm 46, God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried in, into the midst of the sea. Psalm 27 came to mind, and I remember speaking it out. God is my light and my salvation. I will not fear. God is the stronghold of my life. I will not be moved. Train that place of love in this presence. Train that place of love in his presence. And the fear melted away. There was something powerful about speaking his word into the air, speaking it out loud and knowing that there's a reality that we cannot see. We call it the great controversy. It's a reality where there's powers of darkness and powers of good. And God was working in that place and grabbing hold of me, taking my fear. The first I knew that God had done something in Matt's life in answer to my many, many prayers was when he was in prison and his wife gave me a call and told me that because of this very story, he and she and their entire family had received Jesus Christ into their lives. What was intended for evil, as Genesis 50 says, God has used for so much good. It may take time, right? But God knows what he's doing. The word of God is to me life because the word of God is the story of Jesus Christ. And this is, it's his story. It really is. So this is what God is calling us to do. This is what God is calling us to do, to trust him beyond what we can see. The fear may be so thick and so dark that we don't see past it. I know that I read in Desire of Ages that when Christ was hanging on the cross, that he couldn't see beyond the cross. And this is Christ, the one that has all the faith. He couldn't see past the cross. So if he could, if he could go through the crucifixion, and we just could keep our eyes on the cross, knowing that he was able to conquer fear, then we can too. Acts 13, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. This is Acts 13, 47. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, like Matt, right? Like that man. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I mean, how many of us would think of praying for someone that's about to take our life? Only the Spirit of God could do something like that. Because the first thing I think I would do is I would probably kick 
<laughs> and punch. However, I know that as a woman, we are a little weaker than men are. And when their adrenaline is going, I think they can overpower us. So just think of what could happen, you know, when we start fighting and kicking. Not to say that we, you know, someone wouldn't try to get away. I'm not telling you not to try to get away. But she went to God right away. She went to God right away. And that should be our automatic response. Whenever we feel that fear, whenever we sense danger, our automatic response should just be, Lord, save us, you know, just like Peter did. 1 John, this is the ninth slide, I think, honey. Yes, 1 John 4, 17 to 21. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness, boldness to speak his word, boldness to speak the truth, bold, boldness to cry out for him, boldness to claim his promises in the face of danger. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, read with me, but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath, what is it? Isn't that what we just read about? All the things that fear does to our body, to our health, to our life, to our mental health, torment us. Fear has torment, it tells us. He that feareth is not made, what? perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Fear can keep us from loving each other. We can't let that happen. We can't. God has given us peace. He says, peace I give unto you. Do you know how many times the Bible says, fear not? Do you know? Does anybody know? Do you want to hear? 365 times. <laughs> One for every day. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. So every single day, we can claim a fear not from the Bible. Three, I said, that is brilliant, Lord, brilliant. 365 times it says fear not in the Bible. So should we be fearful? We should not be fearful. It's easier said than done, and I know that it's so easy to say these words because when we're faced with the fear, it's a whole other story. But this is just a reminder of where we need to go when that happens, right? What a contrast to godly fear. Let's talk about fear in another sense just for two seconds. A godly fear is, is which keeps us and assures us of eternal life. That's what godly fear does. Godly fear is a precious, all-consuming state of being that enables us to have an eternal relationship with God and to avoid the snares of this world. What is it? It's an all-consuming state of being. That's what a godly fear is. Proverbs 14, 27. Can we read that together? The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Amen. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Fearful Christian, if you are fearful, do you see that we have not been put here on earth to be comfortable, but to fight for the souls of the people who cannot fight for themselves? Are you aware that there are thousands of people starving for the love of God? Thousands. Are we telling them? Our God is a relational God, working through our hearts to reach the hearts of others. He's relational. If your heart has been reformed by Christ, fear cannot hold you back. So, Let's stop letting it. Amen?
Okay, thank you for hearing me. God is good, isn't he? All the time, that's right. Okay, so fear. Do we want fear to be our master anymore? Absolutely not. Amen. Thank you, Tara. Okay, so who do you want to be your master? Jesus, God, yes. Okay. There was this Roman emperor, Marcus, I don't know, Aurelius, I don't know, okay, reigned 150 years after Christ. He was a thinker. He saw that human emotion is not just a product of chance circumstances, but it's determined by the way people think. Even though he hated Christians, he was bang on with the Bible truth that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Psalm 23, 7. We've been saying this all week. We're going to be talking about how what we think affects our emotions and behavior and how having the right master will, pre, will prove to be a health-filled choice. So the issue of life is really in the mind. Everything? Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. And I wasn't even looking at that screen, sorry. Okay, so there's the beautiful man. Okay, and you can pronounce his last name whichever way you want. Okay. So, the issue of life is in the mind. The only control that we have over our lives is choice. Okay, and this takes place where? In the brain, in the mind, right, okay? Some people call it the heart, but our heart pumps blood, right? Okay. We have the freedom to choose or to think in a certain way, don't we? Yes, we do. Okay. We can choose what we eat, when we eat, how much we eat, where we eat, how little we eat, who we befriend, who we marry, how we behave, what we read, what we don't read, what activities we do, what we believe, who we worship, how we react, what we say. You get the point? We choose. And I'm sure you can add to this list because it goes on and on and on. That's why we get ourselves into so much trouble because we choose. Yes. Is our, in our mind is where our actions and beliefs meet up. What you think and believe, says Dr. William Backus, he's the author of Telling Yourself the Truth, excellent book, determines how you feel and what you do. We decide or choose what we are going to believe and what our actions are going to be because of these beliefs. Our actions and beliefs need to support each other. They need to match. This is what our brain strives for. When they don't match, it causes confusion, which can lead to disease. And since a wise God made us, he does everything good, does he not? Yes, he does. And he's orderly and he's structured. So we can see that this mismatch would cause disease. And if you were here on Monday when I was talking to you about my gallbladder attack, okay, so this was a perfect, perfect example. I believed, or I thought I did, right? I believed that God is my God. He is the great physician. But yet he was doing nothing to help me. <laughs> he was not taking the pain away. And so my actions by saying, right, did not match up. So I was unhealthy mentally. And when I got rid of that and I said, you do what you want to do, I was still in pain, but I was mentally sound. Everything was in, in agreement. Misbeliefs are lies of the devil. Simple. That's it. It's nothing, you know, scientific. You don't have to search for years, you know, and go to far off lands. No, it's of the devil. And these lies are totally unhealthy because the devil is totally unhealthy, right? Fear, we learned, totally unhealthy. They produce ugly feelings of bitterness, oppression, depression, anxiety, resentment, anger, oversuspiciousness, and hypersensitivity. These can be overcome by learning self-control, which is what? Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Yes. So we can say sound health always leads back to God. 
Have you ever noticed this? It always, God is the origin of sound health. According to Dr. Bacchus, the fellow who wrote the book, um, Telling Yourself the Truth, in emotional and mental health, what you believe is all important. It makes a difference what you believe. Other people, other circumstances, events, and material things are not what make you happy. What you believe about these things makes you happy or unhappy. The amount of suffering that we experience because of these negative thoughts and beaten down emotions is tremendous. On page 17 of his book, Telling Yourself the Truth, he says, it's not, however, events, either past or present, which makes us feel the way we feel, but our interpretation of these events. Our feelings are not caused by the circumstances of our long lost childhood or the circumstances of the present. Our feelings are caused by what we tell ourselves about these circumstances, whether in words or in attitudes. It's basically what we think. According to the author, um, Freudian, Freudian psychoanalysis is a frequently erroneous personality theory, for it states that all our problems stem from our childhood. Really, we don't need to uncover what happened in our childhood to change our current behaviors. Sure, we can look back into the history, you know, and, and learn what made, what made us be who we are today. It's all very helpful. But we don't need it in order to change. And the reason I say that is because the first story that came to mind when I was writing that was the story of the demoniacs. They came rushing at Jesus. And did Jesus stop and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me get my pen. Okay, what happened to you when you were younger? He didn't. He knew they were choosing. Deep down inside, he knew they were choosing. They were wanting to be freed. And what did he do? He freed them, right? They made that effort, that, that choice, even though they were so overwhelmed by the demons that were in control of their lives. Jesus knew deep down inside they wanted to be free. And I'm also sure after they were freed, they had to continue to choose to serve Jesus, right? It's a choice. Truth, therefore, must be a part of our belief system, or else misbeliefs will make negative thoughts, negative thoughts will make negative feelings, and then negative feelings make negative behaviors, which we know can lead to a host of diseases, as well as loneliness. And always keep in mind who the originator of these misbeliefs is. Who is it? It's Satan, yes, the devil. He wants everything in our life to be negative and unhappy. The worse we are, the happier he is. Let's not satisfy that, that need of his, through Jesus, not on our own power. Not only do we need to be telling ourselves the truth about all circumstances in our lives, we need to be making sure that what we believe comes out in our actions. That is why it's so very important to have truth. If what we believe is a misbelief or a lie, then our actions will be destructive. Some samples of misbeliefs are, I'm not good enough. I will never succeed. I'm not attractive. I'm going to always be alone. What was said was hurtful. I will never get over this. Can you see the problems here? Right? All these issues that can arise out of these misbeliefs. These words are, they're they're like final, right? Which in reality, they're not. Sure, you might not be good at a certain task, but there's always some other job that you can accomplish, right? And those words, you know what? They could have been hurtful, but you know what? You can get over it. Ask God, and you will. And beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And when we are beholden by God, we are beautiful. By seeing yourself as no good, you're going to eventually behave according to your belief. You might isolate yourself. You might become very negative, even aggressive, depressed, etc. And we can all experience this in our life. We all get in little ruts every now and then, but we just can't stay there. If we do, we have the wrong master, 
and we will suffer unnecessarily. When our master is Jesus, our beliefs will be in line with our heavenly fathers and all will be well with our soul. When our master is other than God, we will, we're guaranteed to run into problems. When we look at the eight laws of health, we notice that trust in God is one of these laws. Why would that be? Is it because God should be our master in everything we do and say? All the, the rest of the eight laws of health, shouldn't he be in charge of that in our lives? Yes, he should. If we trust in him to accomplish his word, then we remove ourselves from the throne of our life and place the rightful owner there, God. When we do this, our entire outlook on life changes completely, absolutely. We remove any possibility of stress entering our lives. With stress gone, the following will be gone as well. Chronic pain, acne, headaches, fatigue, sleep disturbances, unhealthy coping habits, anxiety, depression, inflammation, heart disease, diabetes, and the list goes on and on and on. And I must add here a caveat. I'm not referring to the diseases that are caused from genetic predispositions. I'm referring to the diseases that we acquire ourselves by not living the life that God has ordained for us. Remember, uh, I can't remember, I think councils on health or ministry of healing, 90% of all diseases are originate in the mind. That's what we're referring to here. When I lie this down, it works. When I stand it up, it won't, so I'm going to... Lay them down. <laughs> Remember the list that I gave on Monday regarding the health detriments of chronic stress and negative thoughts? Tara actually touched on many of them, so we'll just briefly go through it. In the brain, you know, you have low mood, personality changes, uh, brain cells can be damaged, anxiety. In the mouth, you can have dryness. In the reproductive organs, um, you can have recurrent infections, problems with getting pregnant. In the muscles, um, it's stored as tension, right? You can, it could lead to spasms, chronic pain, fatigue, tics. In the skin, in the skin and hair, stress can cause eczema, acne, hair loss. In the lungs, um, it can trigger asthmatic attacks, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, lightheadedness. In the heart, stress can cause rapid heartbeat, cardiovascular disease. In the digestive tract, negative thoughts can cause blood flow to be redirected away from digestion and then increase, um, increases all kinds of problems. And that's what happened to me. Just it hit me right in here. And that's because of the mind-gut relationship, that vagus nerve. Yeah. Boy, if I would have known that years ago. And then we have constant stress and negativity can lead to an excess of cortisol and adrenaline, which can lead to high cholesterol levels, adrenal fatigue, low thyroid, and a host of other um, issues. So should we keep stress, like right by it, in our pockets, everywhere, fill our houses with it? No, we need to get rid of it. If we choose to serve God, many or all of these problems, issues, diseases could be eliminated. In the Bible, there's a scripture that talks about a man who sweeps his house clean, and then seven more demons come into his house, to his clean house. Do you recall this verse? It's in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. It says, Now, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it roams through waterless, dry, arid places in search of rest, but it does not find it. Then it says, You know what? I think I'm going to return to the house that I came from. And when it arrives there, it finds the place unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and make their home there. And the last condition, is it better or worse? It's worse. Okay. So what's this referring to? Well, the man was freed from his problem, right? And he made sure that his home was nice and clean. And then what? He left it empty, right? He should have filled that space with who? Christ. Yes, but Jesus, Christ, God. Not what, who, right? We don't fill it with things, we fill it with Jesus. And there in the, there's no room for any other company to, to come in and dwell there. When our temple, us, right, is filled with us, 
we are unfortunately doomed to fail. In the Bible, God wants our temples to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not of us. When we do this, we will have health. Think of a hard drive on a computer. You delete some information, but it's still there until you add new information. The old information is still hanging around. I learned this from a CSI or some kind of show we were watching, and I thought, well, you've deleted it. No, they can go in and get all this information again so it's not gone, right? Until what? Until you add more information, you replace the old or whatever it is in there, you have to add more information to fill up those little binary numbers or something. And once that's done, then the old information is gone. Wow. Yeah. It's similar to our brain, right? We get rid of the old information like the man who cleaned his house. But if we don't put new information in, yep, we're going to be in trouble. When we have negative thoughts about anything, we need to replace them with pure and noble thoughts. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what should we do? Think on these things. Amen. You know, the Bible's not just made up of words. <laughs> it's loaded with thousands of life-saving applications. Yeah. And we need to make new neural pathways. Well, it won't be us, but it's, we're choosing, right, to make these new neural pathways so that the old ones become obsolete. When our God is our master, we claim him, he's ours, when we choose to rely completely on him, we will learn what freedom truly means. We will be free to choose health over disease. Remember, again, that 90% of diseases comes from where? From the mind. And if we are in charge of our minds, God help us. In the Ministry of Healing, page 241, Mrs. White says this, the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. We're always trying to heal, heal, heal. Well, what can I take? What supplement can I do? Wait, pull back and let's like relook at things. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. God needs to be in charge. You see, our way of doing things always has an underlying goal of selfishness. It's sin. It's simple, right? It's nothing more, nothing less. This is how the adversary likes it. But God's motives are always pure, always selfless. And if this is difficult for you to understand, you're not alone. It takes us a while to grasp this because we're so used to human way of doing things, right? But God's way is divine. Our finite minds have a difficult time figuring this out. And that's when we need to put our trust completely in him, knowing that his word is true. Whether we understand it or not, do we believe it? Do we believe what we read? If we do, let's smarten up and hold him to it, right? We need to put our trust in him. And when I say this to you, I'm saying this to me, okay? So don't think I'm, maybe I'm pointing, but what is it? I got to point some back to me. Okay. If he said he can trust, if he told us that we can trust him, and that he loves us, we need to take that to the bank and we need to hold him to his promises. The love which Christ diffuses through the whole being is a vitalizing power. What a statement. This is found in Ministry of Healing, page 115, uh, third paragraph. Vitalizing. It gives strength. It gives energy. God must be our master, 
not me or you or anyone else for that matter. We can't be, we fail every single time. And I will tell you that once we're able to really grasp this con concept, it's gonna be so liberating. We'll be like walking in heaven every day. Amen. Yes, amen. The only thing that I'm in charge of is choosing. The only thing that you're in charge of is choosing to have God as our master. And he'll do the, he'll do the rest. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It takes all the pressure off of us. We don't have to do anything. Choose. We have to choose. We do have to make that choice. But he does everything else. I don't know about you. Have you ever done like an exercise program? You have to do everything on your own, right? Right. But here we just have to say, okay, I'm going to exercise. No, but you get the picture. We must remember that God is not dependent on, upon us. We are dependent upon him. I can remember a preacher, and I'm sure you guys too once I say this, who was referring to what, thi what man thinks he can do for God. And he added, lucky God. It's true, you know, how presumptuous on our part, thinking that we can wave something special in front of God and say, looky here, God, what I have for you. And this is a lie from the enemy. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we choose to allow the mind of Christ to permeate our being, then all, every single decision that we make will come from him. And we won't have to worry about our thoughts, our beliefs, or actions, because they're not going to be ours. They will be his. I'd like to show you my dog. Yeah, he's pretty cute. He doesn't, he's actually, he looks quite small there, but he's quite big. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm going to share a little uh, object lesson that the Lord so gently showed me. He just pointed it out so perfectly. And, and, you know, I always go, oh, Lord, you know, people say they, you know, they, they, they hear you and everything, you know, like, speak to me. And he's like, I've been speaking to you all along. You're just not getting it. But I got it this time because it was just so in my face. Okay. When we go camping or whatever, what do we do? We prepare. We pack. Okay. That's a normal thing to do. Yes? Yes. Okay. So, Sure, we can pray for us, that's right. Maybe that's what I need to do, and then my dog will be calm. So you see, my dog is very cute, he's very stubborn, and he's very anxious. In fact, so anxious, he gets seizures. But we've, we've, we've kind of eliminated that because I'm home now. I mean, I'm not home now, so I don't know what's happening to him right now. But um, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so some of you know him, okay? He's like a, a hyper spaz. Okay, but he's a beautiful dog. So anyways, one day, this thought came to my mind. So we're getting ready, and we're packing, because that's the normal thing to do. So he gets so anxious, I, I can't even describe it, okay? He whines and he cries, and, it, and I have to choose to give all that to God. I'm going to remember that, because it drives me absolutely crazy. And sometimes, like, I'm going to put you out, but I can't put him outside because he knows what's going on, and I'm like, oh. So... Whew, right? I have to just be calm. So I'm packing, and he's just walking, I mean, not walking, sorry, running back and forth from the window to the door, from the window to the door, following me everywhere. And if I grab his bed, oh, my, you can't do that, or his dog food or whatever. So I go out. I was able to close the door, get out, and put stuff into the, the van. I come back in, and he wanted to jump right into my arms. Well, he's never done that before to me. He's done that to my husband, Paul, and Paul could actually catch him. He would have killed me. I would have keeled over, you know. But anyways, so I'm like, and the thought came to me, he doesn't trust you. And I said, whoa, that's not about him, is it, God? You're telling me I don't trust you. He didn't say yes. He didn't say anything. He was actually very quiet after that. But I thought about that, and I said, you're right, Lord. I do not trust you. Because I get very anxious, very, very anxious sometimes. And um, I just don't give it to him. I don't trust him. So, you know, I know people could say, well, yes, the dog, he's just getting very excited because, you know, he knows where he's going. And sure, that's fine, and I agree with that, you know. And, and not that he's just a dog, but he's just a dog, you know. And so... But I believe God allowed this to happen for me to realize that I don't trust God. You know, like I think I do, I sometimes do, I want to all the time, 
but I don't trust him. I don't really trust him. So I thanked him for that, and, you know, I put my tail between my legs. No. <laughs> but anyways, okay. Oh, yes. My, my dog had a master. When we first bought him, he was just a little guffer. He had a master, right? And then I became his new master. Okay, but he doesn't trust his new master. I had a master, right, before I became a believer. Then I, be, had a, I have a new master. Do I need to trust my new master? Yes, am I do. So if we truly want to be healthy, spiritually healthy, physically healthy, emotionally healthy, and mentally healthy, we should allow him to do what only he can do, and that's take care of us, right? He wants to take care of us. He's longing to take care of us. And we kind of say, eh, okay, today, maybe Sabbath will be a good day for you to take care of me, but Monday and Sunday and all that, I'll, I'll you know, no, give it to him. He wants to be our master. They were to be the very keynote of life. The very keynote of life. The author, Mrs. White, she stated that trusting in God's care and love is health's greatest safeguard. It's not about us. A safeguard is a measure taken to protect someone or to prevent something undesirable. This is what God wants to do for us. He wants to protect us. She goes on to say that this trust is the very keynote of life, the central theme of our existence. And this is what we need to be sharing with others. How do we grow God's family? We show them that our very existence is because of God's incredible love for us. Amen. Have we been doing this? When God is our master, we're not going to worry about what others think of us or the hurt they have caused or will cause or are causing or anything bad that any, anyone can do to us. Our main focus will be on God and his role in our life. And that's it. All our worries will disappear. All our stresses will be gone. If we are commissioned to be like Christ, which we are, yes? Yes. yes. Then show me in the Bible where Christ was worried or stressed. He wasn't because he took from the master, his father, our father, Whatever thought we have controls the body. Jesus' thoughts, they were on his Father and doing his Father's will. We become a captive to our own thoughts when we or others are the master of our life, or fear is the master of our life. We become chained. This, leads, this then leads us down a path of potential disease. Why? Because no human can supply what God can supply there is usually a selfish cord attached. With God, it is pure unselfishness, pure love. He wants the very best for us. It is, after all, health's greatest safeguard. Amen. Now, how can we apply what we've just learned? There's no magic pill, you know, none whatsoever. Remember yesterday I mentioned that anything worth having takes what? Effort. Right? We need to we need to have the courage to move forward, even when we feel like giving up. But this doesn't come from us. We need to choose to give everything to God and allow Him to give us everything we need. Amen. We need to make the choice to want to draw nigh to God, because when we draw nigh to Him, He draws nigh to us. We need to submit to his will in our lives. We need to read our Bibles so that we can fill up on his truths and promises in order to claim them. Like that woman who was, went through that experience that Tara said, and then all these little passages were coming to her mind. Now, you know, God could inspire us without us ever reading the Bible, I guess. He's quite capable of doing anything, right? But he wants us to read it because he wants us to claim those passages. And if we forget, they'll just come back, right? Because they're there. We need to have an ongoing communication with God. 
We need to catch ourselves when our thoughts are going dark and immediately pray for the Holy Spirit to intervene. We need to choose God's way, always. It's a battle, we know it's a battle, but it's not ours, it's God's, and we need to choose Him. And we know that the battle is for our minds. Let's choose to serve the right master so that he, he's won the war for us, but the war that's going on right now in us, he'll win for us. And the final quote is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 We will always, until Jesus comes to take his redeemed home, we will always have trials and tribulations. However, the victory is ours, because he gave it to us. He's the victory. Let us choose to remember this. Amen. Go forth and conquer. Amen. 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 Say anything? No, I'm just coming up here to pray oh, with you. <laughs> amen. So if we have, it's, it's after five. I don't know if, there, if you want any questions. I mean, if you have any questions, probably not, and that's fine. I don't mind. <laughs> I like them one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> but if you don't mind, uh, Tara's going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have created us for a great work. And you long to be close to your people. Amen. So I just pray now, Father, that we would devote our minds, our hearts, our thoughts into your care, trusting completely in you. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to share, and we thank you for those who are willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And I pray that we will continue to learn from each other and grow as a family of a God and go out there and do the work. Amen. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.